Hello and welcome to Talk Julia. My name is David Amos. And my name is Randy Davila. Today we are joined by Miles Lubin. Uh, welcome, Miles. Thanks. Miles is the uh, you're the creator of the Jump package, right? One of the creators. I would say. One of the creators. Yeah, I imagine there's multiple people involved. Well, uh, our listeners, uh, regular listeners, know that we've talked about Jump many times on the podcast, and so we're absolutely thrilled to have Miles joining us and uh, and and to share with us the history of jump and um and and just talk about all things optimization i think that in one episode i called jump.jl my favorite julia package yeah <laughs> cool but yeah so uh miles tell us a little bit about yourself so where did you go to school how did you get into optimization and just a little bit about your background so our listeners will know a little bit more about you i guess i should start with undergrad i went to the university of chicago i studied applied math and statistics and i guess the Summer after my junior year, I did an internship at Argonne National Lab, which happened to have a great optimization group. And they tossed me, they, they put me on a stochastic optimization problem. And I learned all about the world of linear programming and interior point methods and high performance computing. And that kind of oriented me in the, in the direction of a PhD and kind of started me off on my, on my track. Where did you uh, go to get your PhD? MIT. The Operations Research Center. Oh, wow. That's like one of the best places to get a PhD in Operations <laughs> Research. It, it's, a, it's a good program. Yeah. Um, what did you, uh, I'm just curious, what did you specialize in as a PhD student? My thesis ended up being on mixed integer convex optimization, which is um, very much kind of linking two fields because mixed integer programming is, is a set of, of tools that people use and convex optimization is a set of tools people use and I was studying how how you you could let's say use a convex optimization solver and a mixed integer solver to solve a uh, problem that has both convex constraints and in integer constraints was uh, basically restricting variables to take integer values interesting I as a grad student um, studied mixed integer programming a bit while I was at uh, the computational and applied math department at Rice. And um, I knew of convex optimization, but it was like, that's what these other people did. <laughs> yeah, historically, the, the fields have not talked too much to each other, um, which is why there was plenty of room for a PhD thesis on, in the intersection. <laughs> I'm actually curious now to go and look it up if it's not too much. <laughs> it's not too much. And we have a, a solver out there, a Julia package called Pajarito that's been taken over by, by Chris Coey and, and other students on my PhD advisor. So the thesis did produce something useful, I think. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's almost like a rarity though. <laughs> I can't think of anything useful that came out of my thesis. So did you get introduced to Julia while you were at MIT? So I was still at Argonne at the time. I think I had been accepted to MIT. It was early 2011 where like the Julia blog post came out and mm -hmm. this is maybe pre 1.0 days. I oh yeah. I think I might have even found out about Julia from Slashdot. Um, okay. <laughs> at the time yeah, I was in working on linear programming, um, high performance computing. I got into the depths of C++ and Fortran and all that and it seemed like Julia was really proposing a proposing to, a solution to a lot of the problems that I had been observing. Yeah. Um, so I started out by playing around with Julia. You can still find a repository out there where I implemented the simplex method for linear programming in Julia, just to see uh, maybe like kick the tires and see how it worked, how fast it could be without putting too much effort, and that convinced me that there's something here. And then I came to MIT and that was the epicenter of Julia at the time. And I got to meet all the, the Julia team and went to one of the first Julia workshops. So I was there on the ground when Julia was just getting started. It was a cool time to be there. Yeah, I can imagine there'd be a kind of an exciting atmosphere around all that going on. And, you know, it's been fun to watch the language grow. Maybe I'm biased just because of the kind of work I've done and, and then also, you know, seeing what Randy's doing. But I feel like Jump has been kind of a a central part in in some of that in terms of or or it's a it's an important part of the Julia ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's definitely the reason why a number of people use Julia today. Yeah, I think at one time Jump has maybe like a tenth of the number of stars that Julia has. 
or jump was maybe like 10% of the Julia world. Um, that's gone down over time, but that's a good sign because optimization is maybe less than 10% of software out there. So it should balance out over time. Yeah, um, actually, the people that I know that have chosen to use Julia, like in my academic circle, have done it primarily because of jump, now that I think about it. So for example, um, we teach a course uh, called Operations Research and another one called Decision Math at uh, University of Houston downtown. And um, there's only like three of us that teach this, right? And um, I kind of mentioned how uh, simple setting up the models were in Jump. And then as soon as um, my colleague uh, Tim Radel saw this, immediately went, okay, that's, I'm gonna start using Julia and specifically Jump to solve these, these linear programs because it reads like the textbook would read, right? And there's even a book that we use now that's it's called uh, Julia Programming for Operations Research by yeah. Juan, I think is his last name. I, yeah. Yeah, that, that book just like matches up so well for the students, like just to get used to modeling these example problems. And then we give them other problems to work on the, outside of that book. But that book is primarily based in using Jump. <laughs> That book was, I think it came out in 2015 or 16. And the way it came out was someone just announced on the jump user list, like, hey, I wrote a book. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that, that was very surprising to just to, like, okay, I've, I've worked on jump. I know people are using it, but I had never had the experience of someone writing a, a book. <laughs> yeah. So like, like, it's almost like you're famous, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the history of how jump came about and you know the the people that are involved which i i know there's probably quite a few people involved nowadays but but how did that all get started so it started um my first first year of my phd um i was there with ian dunning and i um for, he was a second year student i was a first year in my first year i had been playing around with julia and i convinced him that it was also worth playing around. I guess I should give context on what Jump does. Yeah, I'm assuming most of our listeners know, but, you know, yeah, I think it's a good idea to give some context. <laughs> so what, the way I would explain Jump is that it's a modeling interface. So you have some mathematical model. Jump helps you write down that mathematical model, and then it takes care of the details of communicating and setting up all the data structures, handling all the um, low-level details of talking to optimization packages that do the actual work of solving the model. So I'd been familiar with systems like Ample back from my time at, at Argon. Um, Ample does a very similar thing. It, it's a domain-specific language. You write down variables, constraints. You can call optimization solvers. Ample's been very successful, and I don't, I don't want to diminish its success, but to me at the time, it seemed kind of antiquated. It was started, uh, came out of like the mid-80s when, when Ample started. Um, it was domain-specific. You can't embed it in, it, it was hard to embed it in a programming language. Um, like at the time, 1985, it was, it was really the best thing out there, but now we have programming languages where that are capable of supporting modeling. It's nice to, okay, let's solve this optimization problem, or let's let's read this database, solve this optimization problem, plot the answer. That kind of workflow was not supported by these standalone commercial tools. That gave me motivation to, okay, let's just see what we can do with, with Julia. Can we just support linear programming in a, in a reasonable way. In the back of our mind, Python was a, kind of the baseline competitor because you can always, you can do the same thing in Python to a certain extent. You can do operator overloading. There's a Python tool called Pulp that actually Ian Dunning had yeah. been an author of. Okay. So it was always in the back of our mind, like we know we, we can do this in Python. Can Julia do this much faster or in some new or interesting way? And the answer, our answer to that is yes. It was much okay. faster than Python and the macros really let you extend the syntax of Julia in a way that you cannot do in Python. Yeah, the macros for Jump are awesome. I love the add variable macros and the add constraints. It's just feels so natural. Yeah, exactly. That was my sort of first impression too, is that it, it felt, because I'd had a little bit of experience using Pulp in Python, uh, which is also, you know, a great package, but coming from that and then doing so, like a similar thing in Jump, it just felt so much more natural. And 
quicker to just sort of write it down and get it in the, you know, get the model set up and everything. So, um, so yeah, thank you for, for that. And, and I guess thanks for the people that work on the Julia language for that macro syntax that it, it just really, you know, makes things so much nicer. To be fair to Python, Python was never designed to do linear programming. I mean, I, I don't know too much about the history of Python, but it was not designed for linear programming and being extended and used in all the ways that it is today. Whereas Julia had a bit more thought put into it and let's design a programming language for numerical computing. And that includes macros because they're important. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's something I, you know, because I think it's, I see a lot of, you know, for lack of a better term, Python bashing go on sometimes from, uh, from folks, you know, in other languages that are like much more optimized or, or, or whatever for, you know, certain use cases. And I think that you kind of hit the nail on the, the head there that, you know, Python, first of all, it's, you know, it's a 30 year old language at this point, the initial design of it, like you said, it was, there was never that sort of intent of like, oh, this, this is going to be the right language to choose for, you know, numerical computing or, you know, doing that kind of stuff or optimization, that kind of thing. So while, you know, the syntax of Python is quite nice and, and I think has helped propel it into the popularity it's seeing now, there's a lot of these like barnacles that have kind of built up over, over the years. And you see a lot of this like retrofitting going on where it's like, well, people really want to use Python. And so, you know, we, we are having to make decisions about how our, you know, package is going to like the API for the package or like certain things that it has to do that that don't feel so natural because it's, well, the language was never really designed, designed to do that. And it's not that you can't do it. It's just that, you know, it, it just wasn't part of the design philosophy. It's nice to see someone kind of recognize that, look, that, you know, that's the reason, right. That it just, it was, it wasn't designed. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, Python has the problem of success. So that's kind of brings a lot of issues with it. And I also think, you know, when you have a language, like Julia or some other language that's come up recently, right? And you think like Go or, or Rust or some of these newer languages and, and people are like, oh, it's so much nicer. It's like, yeah, well, we'll see what it's like in 30 years <laughs> if if one of those becomes, you know, super successful and now people are doing things with it that like <laughs> the language designers never, never intended. But... <laughs> so Jump just recently reached version 1.0, which is a huge uh, achievement. So congratulations on that. Could you kind of share some of the the story like of getting to that point? Like in particular, I'm kind of interested in how did you and the 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 people that work on on Jump sort of know that okay, these are the features we we know we want for 1.0 and and how did you decide when it was ready to actually ship that? Yeah, so um before I do that, I just want to add in that I mentioned Ian Dunning as kind of the first co-creator and Joey Hutchett joined very shortly after. Just want to make sure that that doesn't disappear from the record. The history of, is that in 2017, we had a jump workshop at MIT. This was the year that I was graduating. I thought this was, this is a good time to bring everyone together. Maybe we'll just polish things off and release 1.0 then. <laughs> <laughs> Ambitious. That is not what ended up happening. Uh, what ended up happening is that we decided to rewrite 90% of Jump. <laughs> <laughs> Jump has an abstraction layer that talks to these solvers. That was called MathProg Base. We decided to toss that out and create a new abstraction layer because like over time, well, relating to the Python thing, people started using Jump in ways that we didn't expect, asking questions like, how do I do X? How do I delete a variable? How do I delete a constraint? How do I modify coefficients? How do I combine these types of constraints with those types of constraints? How do I pass this information to this particular solver? And after accumulating all these requests that we really couldn't, couldn't easily address because of the old abstraction layer, we tossed that out and designed a new abstraction layer that's kind of capable of letting Jump solve those issues more easily. So that took maybe two years when we replaced the abstraction layer to 2019. And the 2019 workshop, we all got together and said, Here, here's a list of things we want for Jump 1.0. That list ended up taking another three years <laughs> um, and we it, so the 1.0 is really triggered by okay we've crossed everything off the list some of those things include okay we at like 2019 jump really didn't have a website we needed a website a, a logo and like 
rounding off all the hard edges that that was that were created by the transition that took a bit longer than we expected but cross cross everything off the list we delivered everything that i think we had promised and that that's 1.0 for us it seems it sounds like a familiar story <laughs> of, <laughs> we think we can do this in x number of you know years or whatever and ends up taking <laughs> a little bit longer than you than you plan but still, it's very exciting, and I know you know it's been a huge effort. And uh, I just pulled up the the website here and looking at like the governance page. And uh, so I guess you know you you mentioned uh, Ian Dunning and uh, Joey Hutchett, uh, but I I guess we should also I see here the list of core contributors. There's yourself, uh, Benoit Legat. Is that how you pronounce? Yeah, Benoit Legat. And Joaquim Diaz Garcia and Oscar uh, Dowson. So, uh, thanks to all of you for all the effort you put in. It, like we said, it's one of our favorite packages, and uh, certainly one of the things uh, you know. Randy can talk about this a lot more, but you know that he's found a lot of a lot of use for. I did want to ask about the governance structure, though, yep. uh, a little bit, just to <clears throat> excuse me, kind of understand. I guess maybe the process, the decision making process, and how things kind of, you know, flow through that and, and everything. So could you talk a little bit about how Jump is, is governed? Yeah, so I guess this took a, a long time to be written down, let's say, because Jump had really nothing written down until maybe 2018, 2019, and Jump had started in 2012. So it was Jump went quite a long time without any formal governance process. But as like uh, the original team grew, left MIT, people joined companies, we joined, jumped, joined NumFocus. So that all kind of pushed us in the direction of having something more formal written down. The way decisions work, I'd say it's mostly consensus driven in, pra in practice. Usually most items have a consensus, but my role as the benevolent dictator for life is to, um, if, if there are disagreements, I kind of make the final call so that we can move forward and not get stuck. If you ask the community, I think I tend not to use that power too often. The core developer team drives most of the decision making. We try to make it as open as possible. So we have monthly developer calls that are open to anyone in the community. So anyone listening to this is welcome to, to join. That's when most decisions are made. Any decisions that need discussion are usually handled during the developer call. In terms of, like, I can get into how, uh, how we handle finances. I'm not sure if you're, if you're interested in that. I think so. I mean, I think that would be beneficial, you know, for other projects out there that are, you know, to g give an example of how here's a, a successful project that's, that's doing it. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. So NumFocus is this nonprofit organization. They serve as like the, the legal entity that handles funding. So um, if someone wants to make a donation or if we have a grant through some organization, NumFocus is the, is the legal entity that receives the funds and performs any services that are part of, part of the grant. The way it works is, so Jump has a committee that interfaces with NumFocus and we, on part of that committee, we make the decisions on, do we want to, uh, basically we would agree to some grant or making spending decisions like, do we want to how do we want to do travel support for the jump workshop do we want to print stickers think, things that require spending money where the most of the money is coming these days and we have a couple of blog posts on this there's a nsf grant that my former advisor juan pablo and um, alan edelman are pis on that's um, used in part to fund jump development mostly maintenance efforts and that's I believe paying Oscar to work three days a week. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That has made a huge difference. And we have also more recent agreements with Los Alamos National Lab on developing functionality for nonlinear optimization. Um, and that's going to fund uh, some developer time. How was the process getting into like becoming a num focus sponsored project? How did that come about? I think the process was that I think it's, it's might have changed since we joined because NumFocus has grown, but you, you submit an application. You need to convince them that, that the project is mature enough and kind of distributed across institutions and that like you're ready to both accept money and use it 
for some purpose. NumFocus also has another tier of projects that are, don't have the same what they, of what they call fiscal sponsorship, but they're affiliated with NumFocus, but don't have a bank account with NumFocus. The way it worked is, I think we, we followed Julia because Julia had joined NumFocus a few years earlier, uh, had a dis dis discussion with uh, Stefan Karpinski about if he thought NumFocus was a good choice for Jump. He said, yeah, go ahead. So we put the application in and everything worked out. You know, going back to, you mentioned you've got uh, Oscar working something like three days a week on that. That I can only imagine how big of a difference that really makes in just the day-to-day -day influx of, you know, issues and, and PRs and, and just all the, you know, the chatter and that kind of stuff. Um, is Are those some of the things that Oscar is helping, helping with? Yeah, the, the way that that work is, is structured is it's explicitly kind of targeted at doing doing the important things that people would not do on their own like uh, let's say fixing bugs that had not had not seen any activity for the past year or responding to pull requests quickly um, so like onboarding new contributors doing maintenance of the solver interfaces so there, like there, there's a set of things that that would happen if nobody paid, if nobody provided any funding. Um, but this this uh, Oscar's work through that grant is intended to cover the holes where, like, let's say the open source style is not, the, there's a lot of work that is very important, but if you just let people do their own thing, it would not happen very quickly. Now that you've reached 1.0, with any big release like that, there's always, you know, this sort of the bugs and the things that come in or, you know, that kind of stuff. But have you and the team started thinking about, okay, now that we've reached this milestone, we have, you know, kind of the next milestone in, in mind, or um, are you kind of taking a break? <laughs> the next big thing will be um, refactoring how we do nonlinear optimization and particularly um, automatic differentiation. Jump came in, let's say, I think it was probably 2013 when I when Jump first had support for nonlinear optimization. And just to describe Jump's role is there. So you write you write down some algebraic expressions, and Jump's job there is to um, compute, let's say, the function values, the gradients, and Hessian matrices, so second order derivatives, and hand those to the to the nonlinear optimizers that are running their their state of the art algorithms so we did we implemented this um i think it went through a couple refactors um but that that code has been pretty stable for since 2015 but in the meantime julia has had an, like, an explosion of tools for automatic differentiation and that whole whole set of tools has really not interacted with jump much yet so we'd like to see what the existing tools out there can do let's say maybe they could replace something that that that's jump is already doing or maybe jump can be generalized in a way that's useful for people that not using jump directly so kind of rewriting all the nonlinear functionality of jump i would summarize that as the next big effort that's one of, that's one of the things that we carried over from the pre math op interface world before we did this re refactor of the abstraction layer we said okay nonlinear optimization is very complicated on its own let's just leave that as it is and deal with it later so now is the time to, to deal with it now it's later yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm curious too because that's something i've noticed yeah all the like auto differentiation stuff seems to be there's just a lot going on in that space right now in, in Julia. So I'm sure from your perspective, it'd be interesting to kind of compare notes with, with all that and see, you know, what the differences are. Yeah, it's, it's a very challenging problem, but it's also one of those things where, okay, we, we designed jumps, nonlinear functionality to basically match the existing tools that let's say were ample GAMS, those kind of commercial tools where you can write nonlinear expressions and call solvers. So we designed jump to match that functionality. And of course, now people want to do much more than that which is let's say differentiate through their simulator or other code that they've written or write nonlinear expressions with vectors and matrices that's all very useful but not what we had targeted jump at initially so maybe let's talk a little bit about use cases and some things that people are using jump for i have like two use cases for it um actually three so one being just teaching <laughs> right it's the best um, package 
and language combination for teaching operations research that I've come across. Um, yes, there's other things to use, but for me and for um, several of my colleagues at UVH Downtown, it's the, the language and package of choice when teaching these things. Um, second, as a uh, graph theorist by trade, like my PhD is in graph theory, um, I'm often concerned with computing um, numerical values on graphs, like networks, that are MP complete decision problem type things. Uh, things like maximum independent sets, so maximum stable sets, uh, dominating sets, and minimum dominating sets, um, which are re related to these like facility location type problems. Um, graph coloring as well. And these are, all of these problems um, can be uh, solved on small-ish graphs, not like thousands of nodes or anything, but these problems can be solved uh, with uh, integer programming. And so I use jump to um, formulate these types of problems as integer programs and then calculate these numerical values. And it's fast, faster than pulp is in Python. Um, pulp is still pretty fast though, but like it, jump is, is particularly fast. And with all of these like numerical values I, that I can calculate on graphs, I can like check whether or not like, um, suppose I'm working on like a conjecture and I'm, uh, I think of a graph and I'm not exactly sure what this, like what the cardinality of a maximum, maximum stable set is. It's just, it's hard looking at the thing, right? So then I'll just load in its adjacency matrix, put it into one of my solvers that uses jump and it'll tell me immediately what the independence number is. Right, it's like, it, it can do that on a graph with 80 vertices, like nothing, right? It takes like a few seconds, which if you're looking at the thing, you'll have no idea what the independence number is, right? So it's like a way of like kind of checking quickly. And I, actually I was doing this yesterday. I was sitting outside yesterday and there's there a conjecture that I was working on and I was looking at the thing and I was like, I don't know if this value is correct. And I just pulled up like a Jupyter notebook and imported jump and I like, quickly wrote like a solver for it to compute the thing I was I was concerned about. Yeah, so that's like one of those use cases. But then also with this this data that, that I can generate from this, so I have, I have, I have thousands and thousands of instances of, of graphs, of networks. And as I mentioned in our previous episode, uh, I've written a, a um, uh, like automatic conjecturing program that takes in data and automatically produces conjectures for mathematicians to work on. It, and the newest version of this program I call Christie.jl, and um, it can take in any type of data that you want, and it will pr try to produce conjectures on that data. So it could be like topological things, graph things, matrices, stuff like that. And um, so I can use jump to generate that data for me, first off. Um, I haven't done that in this instance, but I like I've, I'm, I plan on doing that at some point. And then, so I use jump in a third way when generating these conjectures, generating possible inequalities between um, graph invariants, so graph invariants are functions on a graph, and I have a bunch of instances of them. So I can look, I can formulate this process of generating an inequality as a linear program, where like if I want like, if I want like, um, so suppose I want like, I of G uh, less than or equal to some linear combination of this other function, right? Less than or equal to. So I can formulate this as a minimiza minimization problem where the constraints are that um, on each of the instances in my database that that like constraint is satisfied, right? So it, this minimization will make a tight bound between these these things like object like function I and function whatever. So you're finding conjectures that are satisfied ac across the database? Exactly, exactly. And, I'm, and the minimization part makes sure that the inequalities are tight, like they equal each other it, a lot, actually, in, in many cases. Because you want, you, want, you want inequalities to be strong. You want them to be close to each other, right? So um, formulating, like, all the constraints are that this inequality has to be satisfied on all of the, the possible instances, and then jump will find like the slope and the intercept <laughs> um, that like minimize that that bound. And that, that's 
that's if it's true on all the, the data that I have, it can be considered a conjecture, like because the evidence shows that it might be true. And then that's like the first part of the program. And then there's like another heuristic part that doesn't use jump, it like kind of sifts them and sorts them. But jump is um, key to formulating those those inequalities. And it's they're linear inequalities because it's linear programming. But you can get around that by having like a column or like a like an invariant as like one of the other invariants like squared is like one of your entries, right? And then it, it's still like the linear part will be a linear um, inequality, but like the term is squared. Um, so that's how I get around like getting more. Do you then go and prove on paper that that these inequalities hold? I have um, in the past spoke with my Python version I have um, with the, the Christy.jl, the Julia version that uses jump. Um, the past two days I've been working on a problem uh, with some people and just this morning I checked and that uh, my, my um, co-authors uh, found a counterexample, but the smallest counterexample they found was on like 80 something vertices or 80 something nodes. So it was like a, a, a non-trivial counterexample. So currently I'm going through and I'm sifting through and I'm, we're looking at conjectures that the program is making and um, definitely when it comes to, if once we prove one that's like meaningful, uh, we'll definitely like kind of, I will have to write about the program because um, I've never written about any of these uh, conjecturing programs that I've, I've written. But when I do, I'm going to write on Christy.jl and then also like mention how jump interplays with this. And um, it's it it makes generating these inequalities on like quickly, like I just run it and it generates all of them like on the new data set that I have in like seconds. Right? And um, yeah, so I use jump a lot, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, yeah. In integer programming is very um, definitely underappreciated for solving, let's say, NP-hard problems where computer scientists would not even try to solve the problem just because it's NP-hard. It's a, it's a cool tool to have in your toolbox, even if it doesn't work all the time. Right. And like for some like practical problems, it's like integer programming is, is it, it, it solves the problem completely. So for example, there is this, this problem um, called like the, the power domination problem. And it's like, you have an electrical grid, right? And power companies want to put these PMUs, these power monitoring units in that grid so that they can monitor the grid. And these things are like $120,000 each, these PMUs. So you want to minimize the number of them that are in the grid. Um, well, my friend, um, Boris Brinkoff and, um, Caleb Fast and maybe one other person, uh, wrote an integer program to, to like solve this problem. And it will run, like, for all practical purposes, the largest grid that will have to be considered is something like 400 nodes or something like that, which means that the integer program is going to solve it in every instance, like, quickly. So it's like, like, theoretically, yeah, the number of constraints is going to grow exponentially. Um, but, like, for practical purposes, integer programming will solve this, this combinatorial problem. It's a very creative way of thinking about a combinatorial problem to me. Yeah, I, I have some experience working on energy applications also. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll throw out another dump application that kind of impressed and surprised me. Um, there was a, a team at, uh, at MIT that developed a, an economic model of the power grid and saying like what kinds of simulating over long Time horizon, like what kinds of what what mix of generation technology has? Which, which what are the trade offs between, let's say, nuclear, wind, solar, uh, every, things that are uh, people are talking about these days? So they published a paper, and then by chance, I was reading Bill Gates's recent book, I think from about a year ago on on climate change, and then he cited this study from MIT and this study from MIT that used jump. So that that's my maybe biggest claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you've got on the on like on the jump website, there's I see you've got links to several like case studies and stuff. Right at the top it says you can use jump to route school buses, schedule trains, plan power grid expansion and even optimize milk output. All of these link to more detailed case studies. So that's that's really nice that you've got those there uh, up front. Yeah, the, kind of the, the, in general, the types of problems where you would want to use these techniques are 
some kind of resource allocation, routing school buses, routing Street View cars or Uber Lyft cars, or figuring out how to run a data center and run, how do you put the tasks on different machines and data centers. Anything that has kind of like a resource allocation feel is where you might find integer programming, linear programming, and that's where, if you're using linear programming, then then you should use Jump. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what would you say you're most looking forward to for the future of, of Jump? I'd say I'm looking forward to kind of keeping the ship sailing. <laughs> I think we, we've kind of adopted a maybe slow and steady model of, of Jump development, and that seemed to have worked well. So as long as we have this core team around Jump and, and people are contributing, adding new features, we're responding to user uh, feature requests, um, fixing bugs. People are, more and more people are, are, are using it. We have more, better documentation. That all is kind of my vision for keeping everything moving forward and, and growing at a, at a steady pace. I really hope that more, um, like, educational resources come out, like, like, almost like textbook form for, like, at least, like, for university campus, because that's where I'm at. Like, I've, I've thought before that, like, I want to go through, like, this no CDL and write book and just like program like each of the algorithms could just go through that in Julia and then also show how to do that like using jump as well because jump could be, solve many of these things um and just like com like put together like a almost like a cookbook of or, or, or a companion book to this like famous numerical optimization uh textbook and I hope that other like maybe some listener out there will think about that and maybe either help me or start it on their own because I think there's a lot of professors that really would hop on with, with using Jump in, in like educational context, which would then in turn lead to more people using it in industry when they leave. And I hope that happens. Yeah, especially, let's say, maybe 10 years ago, people were using MATLAB for, let's say, working with Nosodal and Write and basic nonlinear optimization. Um, and I. I think Julia and Jump are a very solid replacement for that previous workflow. Do you know, uh, I, I would imagine that, that some of, you know, that has started like at MIT, maybe they're using Julia and Jump in more of, you know, those kinds of classes. Have you heard of a broader adoption uh, beyond that as well, or? Yeah, so for, well, Julia, I definitely, I don't keep track. For Jump, um, we had a list of universities teaching Jump, um, but that was maybe five years ago. Yeah, I, I don't have an up-to-date list. I'd say, unfortunately, like the 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 when things go well, we don't hear anything. <laughs> so I I have a sense that that is used a lot, but the only time people generally come to us is when something breaks. Yeah, but I mean, I there's definitely more that can be done especially on like educational materials for example we've had at the jump developer workshop we have a call for here's the topics we're interested in and one of the points is julia for for and jump for education we haven't had a talk on that topic recently um, i definitely would like to see and get feedback from people using it for education and see what we can do uh, besides just developing the material but what can we do uh, if anything to jump to make it better for for teaching um we'd definitely be interested in hearing that feedback one of the julia github repositories for the julia language there is a markdown document they have that has uh where people can even open a pull request and add like i'm a i'm a professor at such and such university and we're using julia in this you know this course and they can link to maybe those course materials or anything you said you had a list at one point of universities that were using jump do you have something like that publicly available or i think i know what what document you're referring to but we don't have the same one set up for jump I, that that would be easy enough to set up that, yeah that would that would maybe make for, for a, a good resource too just you kind of get some educational resources for free that way you kind of do right if you're linking to course websites and stuff that people can go see oh this is how they're doing it at, at you know this university so yeah any educators listening to to this podcast uh, if you're using jump in the classroom let let the the fine folks at at the jump development team know about it and how you're using it. Definitely, we're we're interested 
in hearing about success cases or failure cases, and if Jump is used for, uh, if, you, if you're use, using Jump for an academic work, please cite our paper. Otherwise, if you're using Jump at a company, drop us a line. You're welcome to talk about how it went at uh, our developer workshop, the developer calls. Yeah, we definitely like to hear because usually kind of the, the stream of information that we usually get is people asking questions or or bug reports, but we don't get a stream of, oh, this worked well, or I spent an hour on this and I got stuck and this crashed. Well, the, people will tell us if it crashed, but just the user experience reports, whether they're positive or negative, please send them over. And for someone that is, you know, new to Jump or, or maybe they're familiar with other, you know, other tools, like you said, the Ample or the, uh, like maybe even Pulp and Python and are interested in, in checking out Jump, where would you recommend they start? I'd say that the Jump documentation, we've put work into making that pretty relatively coherent. It starts with like, what is Jump? Should, should I use Jump? Yes or no? We have some bullet points there. Um, and then getting into getting started, I think that that should be a good place to start. But, but also if people look at the documentation and get confused, that's, that's a good bug report to, to let us know about. Yeah. I mean, we also get, if you look at the Julia discourse page, there's a lot of jump questions that are really just Julia questions, like Julia syntax questions. For better or worse, it's our, it's our job to, triage those and make and point people in the right direction. Well, you're kind of in that space where not all jump users are going to be general Julia users, right? Like yeah. this is a tool they're coming to use to solve specific problems and they're not necessarily Julia program or programmers in general. So, um, yeah, you probably are going to get a lot of those kinds of kinds of questions, but that also brings up another point. So you mentioned you've got a page in the Julia discourse. Uh, or I say page, but some kind of section, right? Uh, for the for category, jump. yeah. Category, yeah. Uh, what other channels are there for getting? I mean, there's you know, obviously you know GitHub issues and things like that. But uh, if someone wants to get some help with something, or is there like, other community aspects that they can they can I'd follow? I'd say the the discourse forum is is probably the first place to go. Um, okay. We yeah we have GitHub issues. We try to keep those strictly as here's a bug or here's a feature request rather than how do I do X Y or Z. Okay. The how do I do X Y or Z? We like to answer those more on 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 discourse. Yeah. Um, but I think that's also another thing that the kind of the grant supports with Oscar's time is uh, you'll see Oscar is very often very quick at answering questions on Discord, so people should feel, if they, if they post something, they will get an answer. I know like, okay, you're working on the problem and this happens to me too, you get kind of confused. Is it worth my time to pose a question? Am, am I even gonna get an answer? Are people going to dismiss my question as, oh, you're, you didn't read the documentation or things like that, but people should have the impression that they will get a useful answer when they post in the, in the jump category. Yeah, and I noticed on the on the excuse me on the Jump website, you've got the community tab like up in the navigation, and if you just click on forum, it just takes you straight to that uh, to that discourse category right right there. So a quick and easy way to to find it. Miles, thank you so much for for coming on and and, and talking about uh, Jump with us. It, we're really just excited to have you here and happy to uh, to kind of get the the story of jump and I, I i imagine that there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are using jump and are you know curious to know more about its its history and everything so hopefully this uh this provides some good additional context for them and everything and it's it's just been a pleasure to have you with us yeah th thanks a lot this has been very fun also my my first recorded podcast as far as i recall um so yeah thanks and all the Jump users, you're welcome to um, come to the Jump Dev Workshop, which will be co-located with JuliaCon this year. So if you sign up for JuliaCon, you'll have access to all of the, the, the Jump stream of, of JuliaCon. Uh, so just a couple of final questions we ask all of our, our guests. Um, if you are editing some Julia, if you're going to work on, you know, use Julia, what editor do you use? I'd say a mix of Vim and VS Code. Okay. And uh, I know you, you might be a little biased on this next question, but uh, what is your favorite Julia package? Favorite Julia package. <laughs> it has to be 
faithful and say jump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll allow it. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much again and uh, for coming and, and hanging out and, and talking Julia with us. And uh, we, we really appreciate it. And uh, again, congratulations on to, to you and every everyone involved in Jump for reaching that 1.0. And uh, we're excited to see where Jump goes in the future. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks, thanks for the platform. And I um, also want to thank all the Jump, both core developers and everyone in the community for getting us to, to 1.0. Hopefully we'll, we'll see, uh, see you around at uh, JuliaCon. Randy and I will, will both be there. And to uh, all of our listeners, we'll, uh, we'll see you again next week.